Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we are continuing our Fall of the Han lore series with episode 5 titled Money, Politics, and Corruption. So far in our series, we have been going in chronological order to help set the scene for the Fall of the Han Dynasty. But as our story gets closer to the events covered in the Mandate of Heaven DLC, we are going to be having more focus episodes, much like this one, where we will go in depth about certain topics and their entire timeline. Well, this could create some confusion as we will be jumping back and forth in time between episodes, I believe at the end, by using these more detailed and focused episodes, everyone will gain a better understanding of our story, as events like the Leon and Yellow Turban Rebellions occurred at roughly the same time, but dealt with completely different issues. So instead of just covering everything that happens in the year 184, I believe it's better to go in depth about the reasons that caused both rebellions separately and then combine this information to provide a more holistic picture. So for today's episode, I want to explore the political structures of the Han government and the salaries for each government position, which under the reign of Emperor Liu Hong transformed into price tags as all government positions were on sale. To start, the Han dynasty copied the government structure left behind by the Qin dynasty before them and the structure is called San Gong Jiu Qing, which can be explained in two parts. The first part is San Gong, which literally means three high-level government positions. And these three positions were originally designed to act as prime ministers for different fields and only ranks below the emperor. Now, this sounds familiar. That's because our famous half-brothers Yuan Shao and Yuan Shu comes from a clan known to be Si Shi San Gong, or four generations of San Gong, meaning that someone in each of the past four generations of the Yuan clan reached the position of San Gong, which is quite impressive. And below San Gong is Jiu Qing, or Nai officials. And although the names of these Nai positions have changed throughout time, their functions remain largely the same from the Qin dynasty all the way to the Jin dynasty, which covered roughly 800 years of Chinese history. And since we're covering the late Eastern Han dynasty, we'll be using the names used for these titles during the period for our discussion here. And instead of me just listing them out right here, the game actually does a wonderful job. So let's first take a look at Liu Hong's court in the upcoming Mandate of Heaven DLC. While this court screen at first glance might not seem to be very impressive, a lot of research definitely went into the design here and completely floored me with the details. First off, we have our Sun Gong right here in the middle, and in English, the titles for these three positions are Grand Excellency over the Masses, Grand Excellency over Works, and Grand Commandant. And in Chinese, they are called Si Tu, Si Kong, and Tai Wei. Originally, these three positions were designed to act as the Prime Minister, the Vice Prime Minister, and the Secretary of Defense in that order, where the Grand Excellency over the Masses had the most power as the Prime Minister, and was assisted by the Grand Excellency over works, while the Grand Commandant dealt with the military affairs. But this was the case during the Qin and Western Han Dynasty. By the Eastern Han Dynasty, the power had become much more centralized as the Emperor and his secretaries made most of the decisions on top, with the help of a newly created position called Tai Fu, or the Grand Tutor, and its position above San Gong. And the Grand Tutor is supposed to be someone who acts as a teacher and consultant to the Emperor. And here during the time of Liu Hong, we can see another position opposite of the Grand Tutor called the Imperial Chancellor here, whose job function matches that of a modern day Prime Minister. So this means that Sun Gong's actual powers have declined considerably during the Eastern Han Dynasty and were largely figureheads with no real power. Even the Grand Commandant who is technically the Secretary of Defense, has to answer to a position called Da Jiangjun, or the Commander-in-Chief, who outranks the Sun Gong as well. Now before we move on to Jiu Qing, or the Nai positions below them, I need to first clarify that the Imperial Chancellor here is not a permanent position that's available for every Emperor, as it was usually a position invented to outrank everyone else by whoever was in control. And in this case, it's the eunuchs holding this position to outrank San Gong. And in the future, when Dong Zhuo takes over, he gives himself the same position with a different name called the Grand Master, which serves the same purpose of outranking everyone else. All right, getting back on track, below San Gong is the nine positions called Jiu Qing, 
And if you want to know their titles in Chinese, I'll show it real quick here. I'm going to skip out on pronouncing them all together and revisit them later as we go over the function of each one of these positions. More importantly, what we need to note here is that by this period in the late Eastern Han Dynasty, Jiu Qing was split up into three groups of three positions, reporting to one of the Sangong positions above them. And the purpose of this subdivision was to weaken the power of the Grand Excellency over the masses, who used to be the most powerful one, and would often end up dominating over the other two and control all nine positions below. So in this subdivision, the Grand Excellency over the masses now only had control of the Minister Herald, Minister of Justice, and Minister Coachman. And these three positions in Chinese are Da Honglu, Ting Wei, and Tai Pu. Now, Da Honglu, or the Minister Herald, was responsible for dealing with foreign nations and minority ethnic groups living inside the empire. Well, this sounds like an important role. It's actually a second-tier position, as foreign policy was quite straightforward back in that time, since all the neighbors were small tribes, they were either at war with the Han Empire or paying tribute as small vassal states. Next up is Ting Wei, or the Minister of Justice, whose job function is to prosecute over criminal cases, much like the job title suggests. And finally, we have Tai Pu, or the Minister Coachman, whose job is to raise horses and maintain carriages and chariots for the royal household, which clearly makes this the least powerful position out of the nine. And as an added trivia here, the character who is in this role on the screen right now is Xun Shua, who is Xun Yu's uncle, and the character we talked about two episodes ago that bragged about driving a carriage for the famous scholar leader Li Ying. And it's funny how his career got jump-started by driving that carriage for Li Ying, which eventually landed him a job as the minister coachman for the royal household. But back to our point about how this subdivision was designed to curb the power of the Grand Excellency over the masses, as he is now stuck with two of the weakest positions from the Nai below them. Next, we move on to the three positions under the Grand Excellency of Work, which used to be the weakest of the three Sangong, as it was designed to be the Vice Prime Minister helping the Grand Excellency over the masses. Under him now is the Minister Stuart, Minister of Finance, and Minister of the Imperial Clan, and their titles in Chinese are Shao Fu, Da Si Nong, and Zhong Zheng. And starting with Shao Fu, or the Minister Stuart, the job function of this position was to manage the personal finances of the Emperor and the Palace. The next position is Da Si Nong, or the Minister of Finance, who is arguably one of the most important positions of the Nai, as he is in charge of not only the finances of the entire empire, but also the land and agricultural elements as well. The reason why finance, land, and agriculture are combined is because government salaries at the time were paid with grain and not cash, as food was also an important currency at the time. So it only made sense to put land development and agricultural affairs along with finances in general. Lastly, we have Zhong Zheng, or the Minister of the Imperial Clan, whose job, like the title suggests, is to keep track of the imperial bloodline and record critical information like birth and death of all the members of the imperial clan, including distant, distant relatives. Lastly, we have the Grand Commandant and the Minister of Guards, Minister of Imperial Household, and Minister of Ceremonies, or Wei Wei, Guang Lu Xun, and Tai Chang in Chinese. Now, Wei Wei, or the Minister of the Guards, is a critical job as he is responsible for the Emperor's safety and commands the Palace Guards. Next, we have Guang Lu Xun, or the Minister of the Imperial Household, who is both a manager of the Imperial Palace and the commander of the Imperial Forces, which might sound very similar to the Minister of the Guards, but the key difference here is that the Minister of the Guards is in charge of the Palace Guards, while the Minister of the Imperial Household is in charge of the Emperor's personal army. And lastly, we have Tai Chang, or the Minister of Ceremonies, who helps set and enforce traditions during major ceremony and feasts. And below these court positions are the Minister of Commanderies who do not reside in the capital as they have to administer the commandery that they're assigned to, and tons of other minor officials that assist in the running of this giant empire. 
But what we are interested in is how much does each of these officials make? And there were roughly six different pay grades that existed during the Eastern Han Dynasty. And they were 万担, or 10,000担, 中二千担, or 中2000担, 真二千担, or 真2000担, 二千担, or 2000担, 比二千担, or 比2000担, and finally 100 to 1000担. Now these sound very confusing, and to understand these values and pay grades better, we need to first understand what the heck a dan is. And the character here that we see for dan is the modern character for shi or rock, but it should be pronounced as dan when used as a unit of measurement, which is what it is here. And one dan equals ten do or ten pecks, which we have used before. So when we previously talked about the five pecks of rice, we were talking about half of one dan of rice. So how much is a peck or a dan? Well, peck is a volumetric measurement that is equal to how much grain or rice can be held by a scoop like the one pictured here. And it amounts roughly to two liters of volume. So if we work out the math, one dan ends up equaling about 30 kilograms of grain. And based on historical documents from the late Han periods, one dan of grain had a market price roughly around 200 wuzhu, or the currency of the time. Now obviously market price will fluctuate depending on the harvest, but this is a pretty good estimate for us to use. And another baseline we should keep in mind is that a middle class household expenditure at the time was around 10,000 wuzhu a year, or around 50 dan if we're measuring grains. So let's revisit the salary levels we mentioned before now that we know how much a dan is actually worth. So you would think the highest salary level, or one dan, which literally translates into 10,000 dan, you would get 10,000 dan a year. But in reality, you got paid 350 dan a month, or 4,200 dan a year. And only san gong and those above them had this salary level. Of course, you could get more depending on how much the emperor liked you and how powerful you were. For example, when Dong Zhuo was Grand Master, he gave himself Si Wan Dan, or four times the Wan Dan salary level for his own position of Grand Master. Below this level, we have Zhong Er Qian Dan, which is the top tier of the 2000 Dan level, and in this level, you got 180 Dan a month or 2,160 dan a year, which actually closely match its name unlike the wan dan level. And the people who could enjoy this salary level are jiu qing, or the nine positions under san gong. Then the next level is called zhen er qian dan, and this level paid out 150 dan a month, or 1,800 dan a year, which was reserved for the chancellors of princes like Luo Jun from our Liu Chong lore video, who would be a chancellor of the Prince Dome of Chen. Then below this level, we have the simple Er Qian Dan, which supposed to be 2000 Dan, but in reality only paid 120 Dan a month, or 1440 Dan a year. And this was the standard salary for administrators. And the last two levels paid anywhere from 1,200 dan or less, all the way down to 100 dan for minor officials throughout the empire. Now, the real purpose of our episode here is not to simply break down the Han political structure and show you how much everyone made, but to actually use these figures to show you how the Emperor Liu Hong sold government jobs as every single position, including San Gong, was up for sale during his reign starting in the year 178. And he created detailed rules of how to sell government positions based on the salary of that position. For example, if a position paid 400 dan a year, then the set price for that position in cash would be 4 million wuzhu, or basically 10,000 times whatever the dan value is. So as we recalled, one dan had a rough market value of 200 wuzhu, then basically the selling price of any government position was 50 times the annual salary up front. If your job was a regional job, 
meaning you would be working in a distant commandery far away from the capital, then the price would double for you because you would actually have more power and freedom in those jobs compared to capital jobs where there will be many officials who outrank you in the capital. And if you come from a powerful clan or are famous for your merit, then lucky you, you get a half price discount. And if you're dirt poor and can't afford the emperor's prices, there's a way for you to buy a government job too. Because you can take a no payment down option where you can get the job first, but have to repay double within the next two years. And the worst part of this system is, let's say you gained a promotion to a new position of higher pay out of merit, then you had to pay 25% of the cost of your new position as a promotion payment to the emperor. And for super popular jobs in high demand, an auction was held instead to maximize the amount of money the emperor could make. For example, Cao Song, who was Cao Cao's father, ended up buying the position of Tai Wei, or the Grand Commandant, with a sky-high price of 100 million in an auction, which was about three times the standard price, just to butter up to the emperor, even though he didn't even want the position and simply resigned in five month time just so the emperor can resell the position again for more money. And this whole system created by Liu Hong legalized corruption throughout the Han Empire as rich people bought jobs not to serve the country and its citizens, but to extract more wealth back from the very citizens that they were supposed to serve. And the good guys were also forced out of the system as you can't afford these outlandish prices if you didn't abuse your position. Let's say you had a government post or were a general before the year 178 when these policies went into effect, and you didn't have to pay for your job in the first place. But then all of a sudden, you being good at your job lands you a merit-based promotion. Then suddenly, you owe the emperor roughly 12 year worth of your new annual salary for the promotion. And if you couldn't pay, then you lost your job. Now clearly, the people hurt most by this policy is not the government officials who lost their jobs for standing up by their principles, but rather innocent civilians who are now being exploited left and right, to the point where risking your life and rebellion doesn't sound half bad, which leads us right into the Yellow Turban Rebellion in the year 184. But before we can go on and tell that story, we also need to visit the Liang province first and talk about a different reason why a second rebellion is brewing at the same time there. So thank you guys for watching and come back next time. Bye!